We are in middle of Torah Yud Chet, Torah 18. This Torah is called Akrokta, a treasure chest. And we learned the first part of this Torah yesterday. And in it, Rabbi Nachman was teaching us about how everything in the world has a purpose. And everything has many stages, really. Everything in existence has many stages. It has the, the main purpose why everything was created. Okay, it has the main purpose would be called, probably Kabbalistically, that would be called the Keter of the highest world. So the Keter of the Keter. Okay, because the first world that we speak about in Kabbalah is called Adam Kadmon. We have five worlds. Most usually what's spoken about in Kabbalah are the four worlds of Atzilut, Beria, Yetzira, and Asiya that correspond to the Yud Kevavke. But then we have spoken about in the past how there's also a higher world beyond that. It's called Adam Kadmon. And that represents the spike on the top of the Yud, of the Yud Kevavke. And that's the beginning of everything. And that's the Keter. And so if we were to see these five aspects and how they are represented in the 10 spherot, so the spike on the top of the Yud, which is the Keter, um, that's the Adam Kadmon, that's the Keter from the 10 spherot. And then the Yud itself would be the Chochma, the He, the first He, Yud Kevav is the Bina. The Vav represents the, the, five, the six spherot that come after that, Chesed, Givur, Tiferet, Netzachod, and Yesod. And then the final hey of Yud Kevavke is the Malchut. And that's what you have in each world, right? So in each one of these five worlds, you also have the aspects of these five worlds, of these ten spherot. But in general, all of existence and the whole universe is made up of these five parts. Okay, five parts Sufim is another way of seeing it. Um, and they're really, that's the ten spherot. And so the beginning of everything, the first sphere of everything, the first world is called Keter. And Keter is the initial intention. That's what it represents. Malchut, the final sphere, represents the actual finished product, the manifestation of everything. After the whole process is done, then you cut to the place of Malchut. But Keter represents the initial intention. And so everything, every world has a Keter. Every specific world, Atzilut has a Keter. Berea has a Keter. Yetzira has a Keter. Uh, and Asiya has a Keter. Every world has a Keter. What does that mean? That means that in every detail of the world, if you take anything in the world unto itself, and you look at that specific thing as a system unto itself, you look at that specific thing as having containing a whole world by itself, then in that specific thing that you're looking at, there is an intention an initial intention, a purpose, why that thing is created. And then there's the, the, all the stages that go through from, the, from that initial intention until that initial intention is actualized and f- f- finished. And that's the malchut of that specific product. But then that specific thing also fits into the bigger picture. Okay, and so it fits into a bigger c- category. And in that bigger category, there's also a tense virot. There's also a keter. And there's also an initial intention of why the purpose for this category of things exists. And then there's the whole process of the spirit from that initial intention until the final manifestation of it. And, uh, and then that category has a bigger category that it fits in. And that also has a Keter and that also has the ten spirit and it has a Malchut. And so if we take everything in the whole universe, okay, and now all the things in the whole universe, they fit into a head category, okay? And so there's a certain keter, that that keter, that initial intention, is the keter of everything else in the world. Everything else in the universe is included in that keter. And that would be the initial intention and the, the main purpose for everything in all of existence, okay? Everything fits into that. And so now that we have this understanding, we can better understand what Rabbi Nachman, what we were speaking about from Rabbi Nachman yesterday. And we were speaking about how there's a Shabbat, okay? And the Shabbat is the Malchut of 
and the Keter, because we also said yesterday how Malchut and Keter are always connected. The end is connected to the beginning. Okay, and so the Shabbat is the Malchut and the Keter of every week. It's the Malchut of one week and the Keter of the next week, and the, the Keter of the previous week is fulfilled, it's revealed in the Malchut of that week. So every Shabbat is a Malchut and a Keter, but then you also have how we spoke about that there is the seventh year is the Shemitah, and that's the Shabbat of all the Shabbatot that came before it. And so that would be like the Keter that's of the higher category where all the Shabbatot beforehand are included in it. And then you have the Yovel every 50 years, and that is the Shabbat of all the Shemitahs, which is the Shabbat of all the Shabbatot. And so that's the higher category that has a Keter and a Malchut also. And then after all of the Yovels, finally we get to the seventh in the world in creation. The world has Shit al Fishne, as the Gemara says, the Talmud says, the 6,000 years have the Alma. The world exists for 6,000 years. And then the 7,000 year is Shabbat. It's called the next stage of the world. It's called Olam Haba, the next world. And so that's the Shabbat, the final Shabbat. And that's the purpose, okay? That's the purpose, the initial intention that includes everything else. All the other smaller systems within it are included in that initial intention. All the other, uh, everything is included in that uh, purpose, in that Shabbat. And that's the Tachlit, that's the Tachlit of everything else. All, everything else is included in that. And so... Rabbi Nachman said also, so that's one point that we learned in the words of Rabbi Nachman yesterday. Another point that uh, Rabbi Nachman taught us is that he gave us an example when you're building a house. He says when you're building a house, so you have the initial intention, you have the clear picture, the vision, how it's going to look, how every room is going to be, and all that, okay? And then you begin the process of building it. And the first part of the process is probably digging up a really big hole and building the foundations and then gathering the wood and gathering the stones and all the things and starting to fill it up and build it found in the cement and right. And so in each stage and each part of this process of building your house, you look around and you're sitting in the middle of this cement foundation and the rocks and the stones and the bricks and the wood hurled all over the place and there's dirt and there's mud and all that, all of these stages really don't resemble my initial intention, okay? Even, even when you finish the first floor and you're now building the second floor, it still doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't resemble my initial intention. You're building the third floor, the fourth floor, the fifth floor, the, the indoor swimming pool, the outdoor swimming pool, the, the personal mikvah, your study, all of these wonderful things that you have, your kitchen, your living, living room, the bedrooms, all of this is all built up. At every stage, it still doesn't resemble completely my initial intention. When can I say that, oh, what I have in front of me right now, this is really, this is, this is identical to what I had in my initial intention. That's when everything is complete, complete, the complete finished product. Okay. And so that's why the Tachlit is connected to the, to the, to the, to the Machshava Tchila more than any other part of the process. The Malchut is connected to the Keter more than anything else in the middle. Okay. That's what we saw yesterday. In, in, in the second point that we saw in Aleph, in first part of this Torah. So now let's move on to Ot Bet in this Torah. The second part. So it says Rabbi Nachman, Veda, Shatachlit Shela Bria, Hu Shashua Olam Haba. You should know. That the purpose, what is this Keter of the Keter? What's the initial intention, the first intention that includes everything else within it? The purpose that includes all the pur small purposes for each specific thing. What's that grand purpose that includes everything in it? Shashua Olam Haba. The delight, the enjoyment, the pleasure that will be experienced by us of directly experiencing Hashem's light on that level that we will experience it in the world to come. That 
is the Keter of the Keter. That's the initial intention. That's the reason why everything, everything is included in that. All the purposes, the small pur the purpose for each tiny thing in all the, the worlds, the millions and billions of worlds are all included in that intention. He says that it's impossible to bring this closer to the thoughts of man. What does that mean, bring it closer to the thoughts of man? It's impossible to make a person experience this, to know this, to really, really connect to this. Already now, in this physical world, in this stage of the process, because that experience, about that experience, it said in Yeshaya, the Pasuk says, I no Elohim Zulatecha. No eye has seen it except for Hashem. Okay, so that's an experience that's beyond, it's transcending this physical realm. It's transcending what any normal human being is able to experience at this stage of the process. And that's why you, you can't bring that to the hearts of men to understand it, to experience it yet. This is something that is said about it. It said that no eye has seen it except for Hashem. But says Rabbi Nachman, Aval HaTzadikim Be'emet, Gam Hem Yecholim Litfos B'machshavtam Tachlit Olam Hamba. But says Rabbi Nachman, the tzaddikim are able to, in their knowledge, in their heart, they're able to connect to this experience. The experience in their consciousness of Olam Haba, the tzaddikim are able to connect to, and they're able to experience it. And says Rabbi Nachman, he says that the tzaddik, the real tzaddik, the aspect of tzaddik, so there's the one tzaddik of the generation, the Moshe Rabbeinu, the, the, the spiritual leader of the whole generation, that collective soul that within his soul is included all the souls of the generation. And he is able to connect to this experience. He's able to understand it in his heart. This experience of Olam Abba, we're going to see why. We're going to understand more about why throughout the Torah. But he's able to experience it. But Rabbi Nachman says it's not only him that can experience it. It's the aspect of that soul, that, that Rosh B'nai Yisrael, that head of B'nai Yisrael, the tzaddik of the generation, that's the aspect of his soul, which is found, the spark of that, of that soul is found within each of us. We all have a spark of that soul. We all have the aspect of the tzaddik of the generation found within us. Because otherwise, if he were not found within us, then we could not say about him that his soul is a collective soul that, that includes within it all of our souls. The idea, the fact that his soul includes all of our souls means that within each of us, we have a source of our soul within him and we have a spark of his soul within us. Okay, and so that spark of the tzaddik's soul within each of us, that's the extent, to the extent that we have that spark within us. And how big, how great is that spark within us? Some people, they have maybe 50% of their soul, 50% of who they are is made up of this tzaddik soul, of the soul of the generation. And some people, they have only maybe 1%. And some people, maybe they have 75%. So to the extent of how much, how great is your part in the soul of the tzaddik of the generation, that's the extent that you, you too, can experience this tachlit, the final purpose and the initial intention of creating the world, which is the experience, the direct experience of Hashem that we will have in the world to come. And so says Rabbi Nachman, he adds in three words. He says that this is dependent on, this is dependent on, that means that the, the level, the extent that you have a part in the soul of the generation, that you have a part of the tzaddik's, uh, the tzaddik's soul, the tzaddik of the generation's soul, that's the extent that you dissolve anger with compassion. 
That's the way Rabbi Nachman, that's the term that he calls it. He says, that's the extent, the characteristic that will be found in you is that you dissolve anger with compassion. You sweeten and dissolve anger with compassion. And so we understand all the, whenever, whenever we have this, this action that's connected to a certain level spiritually, we know that it goes both ways. What does that mean that it goes both ways? It means that to the extent that you have a, a, a bigger part in the soul of the generation and the tzaddik of the generation, that's the, the extent you will have a, in a greater way this characteristic of dissolving anger with compassion. But it also works the other way. To the extent that you increase this character trait, this characteristic, you constantly increase this character trait of dissolving anger energy with compassion energy, that will increase your part in the soul of the generation, in the tzaddik of the generation. Okay, so that's called hafarata kaz brachmanu. You're dissolving anger with compassion. So Rabbi Nachman explains it. Hainu. He says, if a person comes to a point where he may get angry, okay, so maybe there's anger, there's a potential to get angry in that situation, says Rabbi Nachman, do not allow that potential anger to be expressed in any way. Don't allow it to come out as anger. Instead, in its source, when you're still feeling it on the inside, in the potential form, that anger energy, you want to mitigate it, you want to dissolve it and sweeten it with compassion energy. Okay, so that's what it is, is nipping, it, nipping it in the bud, right? Right at the beginning, before it is a chance to be expressed and to increase and to the flames of the anger to, uh, to start uh, burning up and, and God forbid that it should actually be expressed in, in an action or in words or something like that, before it can ever come to that, when it's still in the coals, so to speak, there's no flames yet of the anger. It's still in the potential form. Just turn it out, sweeten it with kindness, with compassion energy, okay? And this is the aspect that we say, actually we say this in the, in the Filat Apayim. We say this in the Selichot, Beroge is the Pasuk from Chavakuk. Beroge is Rachem Tizko. In the place of wrath, in a place of anger, we're praying to Hashem, please Hashem, in that place of anger, remember compassion. What does that mean? That means that in the place of the anger, within the anger, sweeten it, so that it dissolves before it can become anything more difficult. And so this is a character trait that we want to emulate. And says Rabbi Nachman, what happens when we live in this way? Through this, when you sweeten and mitigate, mitigate and dissolve the anger with compassion, you are creating a crown for those who are humble. What does it mean for those that are humble? Those people that are fleeing honor and respect. They're feel, freeing pride. It's not just respect. It's, it's a respect that is disconnected. They are, they are fleeing from honor and positions of authority by making themselves like a leftover, making themselves inconsequential. What does that mean? That means there's a simple understanding to it. Somebody that's boreach min kavot, as the Gemara speaks about it, somebody that runs away from positions of authority and from honor and from people trying to respect them, uh, honor them. Respect is not the word I want to use. Honor them. People trying to honor them. And, uh, and they're running away from that pride. But the deeper understanding behind this character trait is that they don't see themselves as a separate 
they have dissolved the illusion of separateness, meaning they cease to see themselves as a separate being. Okay, and so this is a very high state of consciousness where I, I, to the extent that a person sees themselves as a separate being, so then they need to seek to, to, they need to seek to defend their separate identity. And the way that you defend your separate identity is by finding the significance in your separate identity, right? And so the more that you are significant, the more that you are trying to, the more, the way that you defend, the more that you are significant unto yourself as a separate identity, that's the more that you are building up that illusion of that separateness. But humility is just the opposite. Humility is when you dissolve that illusion and you come to the recognition that really I am not a separate identity unto myself. I am really only a part of the one. I'm a part of the whole. And so this is what it means that he is a leftover. The word shirayim, shirayim in Hebrew means leftover. Inconsequential means that he is only a part of something greater. I'm not separate from it unto myself. I am part of something greater. Okay, so I'm not apart from. I'm a part of. I'm not apart from the whole and unto myself. Instead, really, the truth is that I am a part of the whole. And so that's the aspect, that's the, those that are humble that we're speaking about. That's what it means, humility. And by sweetening the anger energy with compassion, you are giving a crown. You are me'atir. You are crowning those humble those that have this level of humility that are part of the one part of Akadish Baruch Hu. they have dissolved that illusion of separatism and therefore they see themselves only as a leftover inconsequential a part of something much greater and now you are crowning them when you are dissolving this anger energy and Rabbi Nachman explains why first he explains what happens so says Rabbi Nachman. So basically, the way the way that we can see this is that those that are humble are the aspect of malchut. Those that see themselves as humble. Those that, that see themselves as, as uh, part of the one, they are only a part of the whole, and they are only shiraim, those are the aspect of the malchut. Why? We see this in the Gemara. One of the characteristics of Hashem in the malchut of holiness is that uh, to the extent that you find Hashem's greatness, that's where you find the Shem's humility. And so where do you find the greatness of the king? It's in the aspect of his kingship. That's where it's expressed in the greatest way. In the greatest way. And in the Malchut of Hashem, you see this aspect of humility, where one of the characteristics that the Zohar gives, one of the definitions that the Zohar gives for the Malchut, is that the late la migar maklum, she doesn't have anything from her own self. All that she has is from what she receives from the higher spheres. And she always feels herself as a leftover, as a receiver, as the end of the whole process, as part of a greater process instead of being a separate being unto itself. On the other hand, the malchut of the Tuma, the malchut of Esav, the malchut of the idol worshippers is the complete opposite. And it's what the Zohar calls in the, the aspect of saying, Anna emloch, I shall rule. I shall rule, I will rule by myself. I'm an entity unto myself and I have my own significance and I shall rule. The Malchut of Holiness doesn't say that. The Malchut of Holiness sees herself that she doesn't have anything from her own self. It's complete uh, humility, complete uh, appreciation, gratitude. Gratitude is, is, a, is, a, is really what it is. It's recognizing that whatever I am, whatever I have is from what I received from above. And I'm appreciating that. And it's a complete bitul. That's what it is, bitul, a self-nullification because there is no self. I'm only part of the whole. And so this is an aspect of malchut. And the aspect of malchut 
is an aspect that has a lot of judgment energy. It's at the end of the spectrum and it's in a place of great darkness. It's in the physical world. It's always in the place that's most physical in that spectrum of Sphirot, whatever world that you are in. The Malchut of that world is the farthest from the direct light in that world. And so it's always in a place of great darkness, the Malchut. And so that's why the Malchut is always a place of judgment energy, constricted energy. It's in a place of, it's a place of, uh, it's in a difficult place. And that's why our serving Hashem through the Torah and the mitzvot, one of the main purposes is to sweeten the judgment in the place of Malchut. And so one of the ways to do this, and Rabbi Nachman gives us the way to do this, this is basically a rule that we can apply to any other place in serving of Hashem and fulfilling Torah and mitzvah that we know that our intention is to sweeten the malchut. The purpose is, how do you do that? Really, the rule is that you want to sweeten the, the anger energy with compassion. The anger energy is when the malchut is too much, there's too much judgment and that causes anger, wrath to a point where the Malchut can be disconnected from, from the place of holiness and taken into exile. That's what Galut is all about. Exile is about the Malchut disconnected from Hashem and taken into exile. And that's when, that's, that's when, that's why the Gemara says that a big rule that Rabbi Nachman repeats so many times. As long as there is idol worship in the world, there will be wrath in the world. Why is that? Because idol worship is all about taking, it's about denying the truth that Malchut is Hashem, that Hashem is the king. That's what idol worship is. It's about taking a, another, an, one of the entities that Hashem created, one of, the, uh, one of the forces that Hashem created in the world, which are not really a force unto themselves. They don't exist unto themselves, but a person is... Uh, building up that illusion that they are in existence, they are an entity unto themselves, to a point where they actually serve that entity, that, that illusion of that entity, of that force, as the king, as the creator, or as the, the benefactor, the one that will give them something. That's what idol worship is all about. So what, you're, what a person is what doing in idol worship is they're taking the malchut, the, the, the kingship of Hashem, and they're giving it, assigning it, assigning it to some entity, some being, some force, some object. Sometimes it's just themselves. And that's why the Gemara says, and oh, and the Gemara says that when a person, that this is, is causing the wrath, the anger energy in the world. Okay? Because anger energy is basically, like I said, it's the malchut being taken to the other side. The kingship of Hashem is the malchut in exile. The kingship of Hashem taken to the other side in exile. And that's why the Gemara says that a person who is angry allows their anger to take over themselves, to take over their being, right? Those flames, he allows those flames to burn high. A person who's angry, the Gemara says it's as if he's, he, he served idols. Kilo Veda Veda Zara, the Gemara says. says because this is the same one and the same idea. It's the same thing. It's taking the Malchut for themselves. It's disconnecting the Malchut from Hashem. And that is Malchut, the Shekhinah, Hashem's energy dwelling in this world, and is taken in exile, into the darkness, into that place of fragmentation, into that place of disconnection. And here, when you are sweetening the anger energy with compassion, what you are doing is that you are taking the Malchut of Hashem, you're taking that malchut and all of those people, those, those humble people who are emulating the malchut, who are included in that aspect of malchut, because they also see themselves as like the malchut, as inconsequential. They see themselves as being the leftovers, meaning they don't see them. It doesn't mean that they don't recognize the importance and the significance that they have within themselves. But they recognize that that significance, they don't take that significance that they find within themselves as a significance that belongs to themselves as a separate entity. Instead, they recognize that they are only part of Hashem. And whatever significance they find within themselves, all their talents, all their power, all of their abilities, all of their accomplishments, is only because of this light that they are part of, that is flowing within them. But they don't see themselves as a separate being 
I am ruling and I will take this for myself. They don't see it that way. And so all, that's what anava is all about. That's what humility is all about in the Torah. It's not about being a shlemazel, not being a nothing, a no, uh, a no one. It's about being a someone who is a no one because he is part. He is part of the one. Okay. So w- when you are sweetening that judgment, that anger energy, with compassion, you are sweetening the malchut. You are dissolving all of that idol worship. You are dissolving it. And you are crowning those people that are humble, those anavim. You are crowning the malchut. You are lifting it up, bringing it back to its state of perfection. Okay? And so Rabbi Nachman says, brings the pasuk that describes this. Pasuk in Tehillim. Hameatrechi chesed verachamim. Who crowns you with kindness and mercy. What does that mean? That means with the kindness and compassion that you sweeten and dissolve the anger energy, you are crowning those that are humble, the anavim. You are crowning the malchut. And when you do this, now they are crowned with this compassion, a crown of compassion. Yeah. When you are doing this, azami kablinet kavod v'asrara be'al kocham. Then even though those people were running away, they were fleeing any positions of authority, any honor. They were fleeing that honor. They didn't want it. They were fleeing it because they didn't, they, they're, the way that they see themselves and their reality is that they are not a separate entity unto themselves that has its own separate significance. They're only part of something greater. And so therefore, why why it completely goes against their whole belief system and the, their identity for them to now take a position of authority, for them now to uh, to receive this honor that people are wanting to give them. It it, it just it it contradicts their identity and the way that the, the reality, the way they see the world, the way they see themselves, and so they're fleeing it. But when you crown them with this crown of compassion. Then, says Rabbi Nachman, they are forced against their will into receiving this place, this authority, into receiving this honor. Okay? So even though they don't want it, okay, but they receive it against their will as some sort of thing that is put upon them. Just like they see themselves as part of the whole, part of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, So they have that level of self nullification So part of that, one of the characteristics is that when they are forced to receive that authority, that honor, then, then that's something that comes with the way that they live their life, with their reality. They're not taking it, they're re- they, they are given it. It's put upon them. And it's put upon them when you crown them with that crown of compassion. amo. <laughs> And says Rabbi Nachman, and this idea is expressed in the Pasuk that says, a Pasuk in Yeshaya, that says, the Ateret Tzvi, a crown of glory, Lishar Amo, to the residue of his nation, of his people. Residue is the leftovers. Leftovers is those that are humble, that we spoke about, that they see themselves as part of the whole instead of. Uh, they see themselves as a part of the whole instead of apart from. And instead of seeing themselves as a separate entity, they are only a part of that greater thing. And so they're shirayim. They are the residue. They are what's left over. They are not the main. They are part of that, of something greater. And so that's the aspect that it says, a crown of glory for the residue of his nation, of his people. And what does that mean? Lish'ar. So Rabbi Nachman connects to it, this drasha that the Gemara says, Lemi shem esim atzmo kishirayim, the Gemara in Masechet Megillah, to someone who makes himself like remnants, meaning that they have dissolved through meditation and through inner work, through hithbodidut, through prayer, they have dissolved the illusion of separation, of being separate from. And by dissolving that, now they have made themselves into shirayim, into remnants. Okay, they are in the aspect of the malchut. The malchut sees herself, 
You know, she doesn't have anything from her own self. All she is is always she receives. And so when that, when, when, so when you are sweetening the anger energy with the compassion energy, you are giving a crown upon the malchut. You are giving a crown upon these people um, that are humble in this way. We are crowning them with a crown of compassion and that causes them to accept, to be given this place of authority, to be given this authority and to be given this honor, um, even though that they are not seeking it. Okay, I think that's a good place for us to stop today's share.